where I for a while was quite happy to teach and do some research together with Labont. Uh, and now we will concentrate on a topic that might be relevant to that what is discussed in Tübingen, especially in Labont. And that's about the ontological status of reasons. That's the main point of my talk. I will not read the text that uh, I have prepared, but I can say it to you. So if those interested can read it, um, but I pick out the main arguments and then we can discuss these arguments, leaving out many details that are important, but maybe we should focus on the main arguments on that, what is called the train of thoughts <laughs> in English, the train of thought. Now, the first part is what is the role of reasons? Now, let's leave out for a moment what a reason is. But nobody can doubt that we are guided by reasons. One might discuss to what extent we are guided by reasons. So some psychologists say it seems that we are guided by reasons because we usually can give reasons for our behavior or our beliefs. But uh, this is uh, superfluous, a uh, superficial, a uh, superficial observation because in many cases there are causes that we as psychologists or psychoanalysts can tell. So maybe this is a big illusion. Well, I think there are good arguments to reject that account, but I leave this out for a moment. I just assume that reasons play a role in our everyday life, in how we act, how we judge, and maybe third realm of objects, what we feel, our emotions, or at least a certain part of our emotions, emotive attitudes. So we are, for example, angry, or we resent somebody, famous article written in uh, Strawson in 1960, I think, uh, where he argued, well, if I resent something, some action or some person, I cannot resent this person or this action without having reasons for this resentment. So without assuming that the person I resent has done something wrong, had the wrong motives or the wrong reasons to act like this. So even good part of our emotional state is depending on reasons, it seems. So we have three realms of objects, beliefs, agency or action, practices, second and third emotive attitudes. Let's call this part of emotions that can be affected, affected by reasons, emotive attitudes. And uh, one important school of philosophical thought um, began there. This is the school of Stoa. So where are we really free, seen on thought? And he answered, well, we are free, but only regarding our attitudes. And we are free because we can have hormai logikai and hormai non ah logikai, meaning that these reasons are irrational. And then we are, as a person, irrational. Okay. So reasons play a certain role. We leave it open for the moment how big the role is, but we do not leave it out. How, uh, uh, open whether they play a role, reasons play a role for belief, agency, and emotion. Now, the first trait of reasons that leads to the question, what is the status of reasons, is normativity. 
So it seems that all kind, kinds of reasons are normative. Or to put it shortly, they speak in favor of, they speak in favor of a belief, of an action, of a certain emotive attitude. So reasons are normative in the sense that they speak in favor of. We can't understand reasons if we don't grasp the normative nature of reasons. If some use the term, the expression reason and explicitly or implicitly rejecting its normative character, then this is a form of confounding or confusion between reasons and causes. Reasons are normative. Causes are explanatory. So reasons can also have a role in explanations, as we will see later. And causes are relevant for reasons, but reasons are not causes. Causes are not normative. Reasons are normative. So this is the first step of my argument. The trait is reasons of all kinds, of all three normative. And this results in a first or second, as you like, thesis, a first ontological or metaphysical thesis. If we accept that reasons are relevant for what we do, what we believe, and what we feel in the sense of emotive attitudes. Then, and if we accept that reasons are normative, then an all comprising naturalism fails. The reason is simple. The reason for this, the failure, of an all comprising metaphysical ontological naturalism is that naturalism um, is based on the idea that all what we can describe or observe or theorize about it can be done in the conceptual framework of natural science. Now, I myself studied physics, so I know a little how the conceptual framework of this basic natural science works. And one thing is totally sure. Normativity is not part of the conceptual frame that would allow physics to describe, analyze, propose, reject, and so on and so forth reasons. Reasons are no possible object of the physic of natural physics. Yeah. Physics understand in the modern sense, yeah. nuclear physics. Second step, second step is objectivity. And we start from an observation of our everyday language of ordinary, everyday language. We use expressions in Italian, in German, in English at least, also in ancient Greek, <laughs> Logon di Donai, that can only be interpreted objectively in the sense that they make sense only if reasons are something objective and not subjective. For example, we say, let's try out which reasons speak in favor of that. Or you are wrong in assuming that there is no good reasons, reason to do this. Or you are wrong in believing this because there is no good reason in favor of this belief. So your belief is irrational. 
or you have an emotive attitude and you say you have no reason to resent this person even if you think you have a good reason in fact you have no good reason to resent so this form of speaking wouldn't make any sense if reasons were nothing else than certain traits of subjective states. We try to find out which reasons speak in favor of something. We try to find out if reasons were nothing else than a certain element of our present emotional state, subjective state, then full stop. Then we could only inform others about our, this state we are in. Insofar, on my account, and I'm quite radical as you see, it's wrong to assume that reasons are a form of preferences. Reasons are no preferences. The confusion here is the following. Adopting a reason, accepting a reason, thinking that something is a reason is part of our mental state and adopting a reason may have psychological effects that might be even causally analyzed so adopting accepting um, and so on is part of our mental state. So this is part of our subjective state. But the reason itself is not part of our mental state. To make this point a little more clear, I give another example. There is a widespread erroneous or misleading uh, form of expressing oneself. If somebody thinks that uh, something is a fact, but it is not a fact. You hear persons saying, well, this is only a subjective fact. Subjective fact. Likewise, you might say subjective or speak of subjective reasons. Well, this in Greek is a oxymoron. <laughs> yeah. It is logically excluded that something is merely subjective and a fact. It is logically excluded that something is a reason and is merely a preference. To adopt a reason may lead to certain preferences. To accept a reason may lead to certain preferences or may express itself in the form of preferences. But that's something else. There are no subjective facts. There are no subjective reasons. Reasons and facts are objective. And we try to find out which reasons hold, which facts hold. And this is true not only for empirical facts, also for mathematical facts, for logic facts, and many others, other types of facts. So this is the second trait, objectivity of reason. Now, if this holds, so if reasons are objective, they are not part of the mental world. So their status cannot be described by means of psychology. And this is quite important because this leads us back to Husserl and Frege, Frege the grandfather of analytic philosophy and Husserl the father of phenomenology, who both, who both were convinced that logic is not part of psychology. So what I say is nothing else. Reasoning is not part of psychology. Giving and taking reason is part of the logical world, so to say. Now the third trait that might be especially um, exotic. This is non-algorithmicity. Um, not so important. 
well, this is a discussion. Is it important or is it not important? Um, the physicist Roger Penrose, who got as a very <laughs> old person in the meantime, the Nobel Prize last year, I think he should have got it at least two decades earlier or three decades earlier. So Roger Penrose has written two big monographies uh, and many articles on that question. Uh, he even believes that the uh, phenomenon of consciousness, that consciousness exists, depends on non-algorithmicity or non-decidability. Um, I think he's right, but I'm not sure whether his arguments are really convincing. Um, but it's very interesting to read these books and articles of Roger Penrose. Now, I go, do not go so far for the moment. I do not go into the mind-body philosophy and the philosophy of consciousness. I restrain my argument to a more obvious um, fact, a logical fact. And this logic effect, uh, we found this logic effect by a quite short and uh, ingenious proof of Kurt Gödel in 1930. In fact, there were two theorems. The second theorem, he didn't prove, prove the second theorem, but it's um, more or less a corollary of the, thir of the first. And... Um, this seems to be a result that is of interest only for logicians, logicians and math mathematicians, but that's not true. Um, it shows that systems of logic or mathematics that are um, sufficiently complex, but they are soon sufficiently complex, have a strange trait. The trait is that you can prove, and this is a metalogical result, that at least one theorem, so one true uh, proposition, uh, cannot be proven within that system. Oh, that seems harmless. And one might say, well, is this of any ontological metaphysical interest? Yes, I think it is. Now, take first order predicate logic, logic, so quite simple form of logic, a little bit more complex than propositional logic. The result of the Gödel theorem is that there is no algorithm. There is no, there does not exist an algorithm that proves all the theorems of first order predicate logic. Or to put it in other words, there is no Turing machine that produces the lines of the proofs you need to prove the theorems of first order predicate logic. And this is true a fortiori for all richer systems. Second, third order predicate logic, and so on and so forth the ontic logic, modal logic, and so on. So what do I deduce from that? Now, now there is a very important point. This is philosophy of logics. One might discuss that. And there are some in logics that oppose to this interpretation that I hold. I hold that the relevance as a pragmatist, so to say, the relevance of systems of logics is that it systematizes a part of our reasoning, of our human reasoning. It sometimes goes beyond that. So it, the systematization, as many systematizations do, yields results that go beyond that established as everyday life world reasoning and it um, in most cases is less forceful than our everyday life world reasoning so for example there is no 
not even one system of deontic logic that adequately allows to reconstruct normative systems like that of the lawful, lawful system, juridical law, as an example, or certain, the, uh, certain theories of ethics. So the relevance of logics is to systematize reasoning. Reasoning that is simple and reasoning that is quite complex. And now we know from Gödel that reasoning, even of a quite simple form, is not algorithmic. This leads to a far-reaching result. Reasoning, human reasoning in general, maybe some parts of it, cannot be causal. Cannot be causal processes. Because causal processes, at least as it as causality is usually understood in natural sciences and in the general philosophy of science, is algorithmic. So reasoning is something else. Or my, one might even put it now quite metaphysically stated, in reasoning, we leave the natural world. That what's going on in reasoning, to put it less metaphysically, is something that cannot be described by means of physics alone. So that's the third thesis. Now one might assume that this all cannot be upheld if we go to social facts, because social facts are themselves constituted um, normatively, and this is right, social facts are constituted by normative expectations, normative reasons, by every practice that is guided by normative reasons. But this doesn't mean that social facts are in one way or the other um, bound to the mental world. John Searle, who is quite important for Labont and for, uh, for Maurizio Ferrari's uh, new form of realism, uh, has written a wonderful book about it. So social facts as psych psychological facts are objective, but nevertheless, the objectivity of social facts describes the role of normativity, the constitutive role of normativity for social facts. So social facts play an important role for practical reasons because social facts are to a good part normative. I give an example. Example has, This example again has something to do with John Searle, very early book, Speech Acts. Um, I think it's chapter eight there, where he argues against the naturalist fallacy in the following way. He says, by the fact that John says to Margaret, uh, I promise to come tomorrow at six to the cinema, this fact, by some further steps, um, allows us to deduce the duty of John to come to the cinema uh, the next day at six. Now, what's going on here? And the reaction of almost all philosophers, myself included, when I read it the first time, was, well, there is something left in this deduction, seeming a deduction of a normative fact from an empirical fact. Um, we left something out. And this is a criterion, a normative criterion that, for example, tells everybody who has given a promise as to act such that he can fulfill this promise, for example. So without such a general rule or principle, there is no deduction possible from the empirical fact that something said something to the normative fact that this person has a duty or an obligation 
to do such and such. I think it took me 20 years to understand that this interpretation is not convincing. The reason is that if it were convincing, then our normative attitudes, our normative judgments would totally depend on, on some basic principle that we, or some basic principles um, that we had to justify again. Now, why, how do we know that we should fulfill every promise? Well, we know it because we have a life world reasoning that in many cases, not in all cases, gives me the obligation to do something if I promised it. It's not the other way around. We do not wait for the theory. We do not wait for the principle. But the question is how and how is the justification of this principle? A priori? A priori? Really? Merely a priori? No, we are part of a certain life world, a world, a form of life, Lebensform. Wittgenstein uses his term six times in his writings only, but it's quite important for his philosophy, Lebensform. And as Wittgenstein says, all reasoning ends there. Not one shouldn't understand this sentence like Lebensform cannot be criticized. It can and must be criticized, but not from the outside, from the inside. Well, this is another topic and I cannot go into this more deeply. If you like, we can uh, discuss it afterwards. Now, what we have here, we have a relation of reasons. The normativity is embedded into certain life world practices or Lebensformen, life world practices. And we are part of life world practices. We understand others because we share a good part of their reasoning. If we wouldn't share any part of their reasoning, we couldn't understand each other. To have some uh, fight about what to do or not to do, some dispute about what is a good argument, what not, what is a good belief and what not, and so on, depends on a good part of common knowledge, common assumptions, common reasons, a common conceptual frame. And this is embedded and dependent on a shared form of life. So this leads to the question, how are theoretical and practical and emotive reasons interrelated? And, when, and I would say there is no deep categorical difference. Reasons speak in favor. They speak in favor of beliefs. They speak in favor of certain actions or agency. They speak in favor of certain emotive attitudes. And in all these three realms of reasoning, Judgment plays an important role. I try to find out what's right to do. I try to find out what's the adequate emotional attitude. I try to find out what, a well, what is a well-founded belief, and so on and so forth. So it's all an epistemic enterprise, what we are in. So giving reasons, Logon di Donai, giving reasons, is a form of an epistemic enterprise. And there's no mystery that this enterprise is non nevertheless normative because reasons are normative. If you try to find out what reasons there are, what reasons objectively there are. Reasons are not part of the subjective world and reasons are not part of the physical world. So in that sense, reasons are part of the logical world. And all these three worlds hinge together. This is our uh, worldview that we have, that they hinge together. 
and that we can try to analyze the natural world, by exa for example, by using the means of reasoning, the logical world, and likewise, the mental world. So this is my more and more at the end, metaphysical count of reasons, my contribution to the status of reasons. But this is not a metaphysics that is isolated from other, other parts of my philosophy. It's part of my philosophy of practical reasoning, of practical reason in general. So in that sense, it's a pragmatist account. Okay, thank you very much. Now we have time for discussion. Lots of time. Grazie mille. Grazie. Grazie. Bellissimo, come sempre. È molto ricco.